Welcome back to the Cisco NetAcad CCNA Enterprise Networking Security and Automation Lecture Series. If you haven't seen my previous lecture series covering CCNA 1 and CCNA 2, I will leave links in the description for those playlists. I would recommend that you go through the previous CCNA lectures before moving forward with this lecture series. Today, I will cover module number two, which is single area OSPF version two configuration. In our last module, we went over the fundamentals of single area OSPF version two. Today, we're gonna to look at how we can implement single area OSPF version two in both point to point and broadcast multi-access networks. We will cover OSPF router ID, point-to-point -point OSPF networks, multi-access OSPF networks, how you, you can modify single area OSPF version two, default route propagation, and how we can verify the single area OSPF um, version two after the implementation. OSPF router ID. OSPF reference topology. In the figure shows the topology used for configuring OSPF version two in this module. So this is that the example uh, network that we're gonna build. The routers in the topology have a starting configuration, including the interface addresses. There is currently no static routing or dynamic routing configured on any of the routers. All interfaces on R1, R2, R3, except the loopback one on R2, are within the OSPF backbone area. The ISP router is used as the gateway to the internet of the routing domain. So this is the networking diagram that we're gonna use the topology for the next few slides. So if you would like to take a screenshot of this, as we go through this lecture, you can do that. Um, this lecture is, as always, sometimes a little bit uh, lab heavy. So this is gonna be just, I'm talking about the slides and the concept associated with it so that you have a better idea about the, um, the key concept of OSPF version two. But then I will post, a separate videos on lab demonstration uh, on how you can configure OSPF on a live lab demo and will be posted to my YouTube channel later. So keep that in mind as we go through any of these lectures with lab heavy uh, concepts, okay? So remember this topology. So you have three routers, R1, R2, and R3. And all interfaces on R1, R2, R3, except the loop back one on R2, are within the OSPF backbone area uh, because the loopback one is connected uh, to the internet. So this is the diagram we are using for the next few slides. Router configuration mode for OSPF. OSPF version two is enabled using the o router OSPF, then you're gonna enter the process ID associated with that in the global configuration. So on Cisco routers, you can go into the global configuration. Uh, you know you are in global configuration, remember, because you have the config right here, right behind the, this pound sign. So the how you're gonna enable it is going uh, by entering the command router OSPF, and then you have to give it a process ID, which is an option that you can enter. So that, so router OSPF, and in here we have entered 10, so that will be the process ID. So what is the process ID? The process ID value represent a number between one and 65,535 and is selected by the network administrator. The process ID value is locally significant. It is considered the best practice to use the same process ID on all OSPF routers. So if you are creating the OSPF version two configuration with a new system, if you use router OSPF 10 on part of your network configuration, I would use the same thing for other routers within that OSPF version two region. So it's, it is you know, uh, considered the best practice to use the same process ID on OSPF routers. So that's uh, a key concept that you should learn. Uh, for your exams and quizzes, 
Uh, I never seen Cisco asking what is the you know the maximum OSPF um, uh, route IDs you could have. However, uh, because it is part of the lecture and they actually put it in here, I would recommend that you remember that the maximum number is 65,535, just in case Cisco changes the way that they do exams and ask you a such question, okay? And also, if you are taking this class to a academic institution, during the lab exam, some uh, schools uh, will may ask you, uh, the instructor may ask you questions, verbal questions, and one of the questions could be, hey, you know, what is the process ID value and what is the maximum value that you can put it in? So you should remember that because it's a, it's good to know as a network administrator anyway, right? So remember that. Router IDs. An OSPF router ID is a 32-bit value represented as an IPv4 address. It is used to uniquely identify an OSPF router and all OSPF packets include the router ID of the originating router. So remember that. The router ID is used to uniquely identify an OSPF router and all OSPF packets includes the router ID of the originating router. So that's how we know where the packet got originated, right? So every router requires a router ID to participate in OSPF domain it can be defined by an administrator or automatically assigned by the router. So either or would work. The router ID is used by an OSPF enabled router to do the following items. So there's two things that the router ID is gonna do. It allows us to participate in the synchronization of OSPF databases. So during the exchange state, the router with the highest router ID will send their database disk, disk, uh, disk Cypher, <laughs> sorry about that, Data, database decipher also known as the DBD packet first. So remember from our previous lecture, the, the how, how, you know, I mentioned a little bit about router ID and we, we talk about the exchange state and different states of OSPF. So the router ID allow us to, you know, use that highest router ID uh, to you know make it uh, be the you know send the data set based decipher with its uh, packets so during the exchange state the router with the highest route id will send their database decipher or deep dbd packets first so that participate in synchronization of ospf databases is one of the key features of route id and another reason why we uh, you another reason why we use route ids is, is to participate in the election of designated router also known as dr so in a multi-access LAN environment, the router with the highest route ID is elected as the designated router. The routing device with the second highest route ID elected uh, uh, as the backup designated router. So the DR and BDR are selected also based on the route ID. So the highest one gonna take the designated router position and the second highest gonna take the uh, backup uh, uh, designated router position on the OSPF. Router ID order of precedence. Cisco routers derive the router ID based on one of three criteria in the following preferential order. The router ID is explicitly configured using OSPF router ID command, uh, router configuration mode. So in the, uh, in the router configuration mode, you can use the router dash ID command. And this is the recommended method to assigning a router ID. So this is the best method to assigning a router ID. Or the router chooses the highest IPv4 address of any of configured loopback interfaces or the router chooses the highest active IPv4 address of any of its physical interfaces. So these are the preferential order in that order, one, two, three. So on the right hand side, we see the decision making process the OSPF configured routers would go through on how router IDs are selected. So we have on the here, we the router ID explicitly configured. If it is yes, then they're gonna use that as the router ID and that's the end of it. But if the router ID is not explicitly configured using the router dash ID command, it's gonna go in and search for IPv4 loopback interface uh, 
And if the IPv4 loopback interface is configured, then what's going to happen, the highest IPv4 address of any configured loopback interface will be used as the router ID. And then that would be it. But if neither of these are set up, this is not set up and this is not there, then what's going to happen is they're going to use, the router going to use the highest active configured IPv4 address as its router ID. So this is the decision making process. And what we recommend for network engineers and administrators is to actually use the router ID and assign explicitly what should be the router ID for each of your routers within your OSPF uh, version 2 uh, configuration. Configure a loopback interface as the router ID. So instead of relying on physical interface, the router ID can be assigned to a loopback interface. Typically, the IPv4 address for this type of loopback interface should be configured using a 32-bit subnet mask, which is 255.255.255.255. This effectively creates a host route. So by creating this loopback interface, what's going to happen is it effectively going to create a host route. A 32-bit host route would not get advertised as a route to other OSPF routers. OSPF does not need to be enabled on an interface for that interface to be chosen as the route ID. So that's another key piece of information of using the loopback interface as the router ID. So how would you go about doing it in your uh, configuration, interface configuration mode? Uh, so you can enter interface loopback and you can put loopback one. Uh, or whatever you like and then you go IP address and then you can enter the IP address and the subnet mask. So this is subnet mask is set to 255.255.255.255 because it's a 32-bit subnet mask and the interface should be configured using a 32-bit subnet mask for this to work. And then if you run show IP protocols and we pipe or filter out the include route ID, you will see the route ID now set as 1.1.1.1, which is the same as the loopback IP address. So that's how you can configure a loopback interface as the router ID. Explicitly configure a router ID. So this is what we actually recommend that most uh, situations, uh, you know, what we recommend for system administrators and network administrator use uh, in most uh, situations. So if you are at work or if you are doing a lab exam or something like that, unless uh, it is told to not to do this, um, if you have the option of working with the explicitly configured route ID, this would be the best option for OSPF configuration. So in here, in our reference topology, the router ID for each router is assigned as follows. Remember our reference topology from a few slides back, I told you that you could take a screenshot. If you haven't taken a screenshot and if you don't remember the reference topology, you can go back in this video and take a screenshot of that reference topology that we are working with. And in, in that topology, the router one, R1, uses the router ID 1.1.1.1 and the R2 uses the route ID 2.2.2.2 and the R3 conveniently use the route ID 3.3.3.3. So use the router ID, uh, router configuration mode in the router configuration mode to manually assign a router ID for each one of those. So in this in example, the route ID 1111 is assigned to R1 and we can use the show IP protocols command to verify that the router ID has been sent. So in here we have enter into the OSPF 10 and then uh, we go router dash ID and you're going to enter the IP, uh, you know the, the ID number which in here is the IP address 1.1.1.1 and you're going to exit out of it. Now if you run the show IP protocols and you pipe out the uh, router ID information. Now you can see that the router ID is now assigned here as 1.1.1.1 because in this OSPF area 10, we actually entered the route ID right here. This is the best method to do the route ID. So I'm going to repeat that again. It's very important that you understand if somebody asks on an exam or quiz, what is the best option? Like what is the recommended option? This would be the recommended option, which is the explicitly defining the router IDs. So how do you modify a route ID? After a router selects a route ID, an active OSPF router does not allow the route ID to be changed until the router is reloaded or the OSPF process is reset. 
clearing the OSPF process is the preferred method to reset the route ID. So the preferred method of, uh, you know, um, of resetting your route ID is to clearing the OSPF process. So in here, in this example, we have the router one and we enter the show IP protocols and we're gonna pipe that uh, or filter out the route ID and we see the route ID at 10.10.1.1. And in configuration terminal or config T mode, uh, you see um, some, uh, you know, you can enter some information here in, in configuration terminal mode. Uh, so in router ID or SPF 10, we have the router ID 1.1.1 set. And then at the end, you can run this clear command, clear IP or SPF process, which will reset the router ID. So if you run the clear IP OSPF process, it will, it will reset the route ID. So initially we had the route ID of 10.10.1.1. Then we changed the route ID in the uh, router OSPF 10. Uh, we have entered router ID 1.1.1. So now this router should have a, this route ID. But if you do not enter the clear IP OSPF process, that may not get reset to the 1.1.1 uh, you know route id because it will still have the 10.10.1.1 um, and then it will give you uh, the you know uh, kind of a warning like do you want to reset all ospf processes and you're going to say yes and then you're going to reset it and now if you run the same command show ip protocols and uh, you know filter out the route id now it has been changed from 10.10.1.1 to 1.1.1.1 because we change it up here this is also uh, a good uh, method of troubleshooting some of the OSPF issues during your lab exams and stuff, even if you haven't entered a different route ID. So if you had, if you were to enter this up here and you came back with 1.1.1.1 and that's what exactly you need, but your OSPF is not working or there's something wrong, you can run the clear IP OSPF process on all of your routers and see if that's gonna fix some of the problems because I've seen sometimes uh, Issues get, issues get resolved by entering this command. So it's not just for resetting the route ID because it is resetting the entire OSPF process. This is a good troubleshooting method um, to use during lab exam, especially because it's timed, right? So my lab exam was like, I believe two hours. And if I screwed up something, there is no way to go back and fix everything. You're gonna lose everything. So I was able to obtain 100% on most of my lab exam. Um, so yeah. So knowing these key little tricks as you go through, uh, or not only for f uh, setting up these processes, like for example, OSPF version two, but also how to troubleshoot it. So think, when you go through these lectures and modules, think about also the troubleshooting side of things, even though that would be a different course that I'll be covering later. But for now, you know, just remember, you know, the troubleshooting side of things as you go through it, think about that side, uh, because that is also an important concept uh, to understand, right? So I was able to obtain 100% on every single lab exam, except one I got like 97 or something. I have an A, A plus grade with a 4.0 GPA. Uh, and there's a reason for that, that because of I always think about troubleshooting methods every single time I go through these kind of lectures. So it's not just setting it up, you should also think about the troubleshooting side of aspects of it. Maybe I will discuss that in my future lectures as well. Point to point OSPF networks. The network command syntax. You can specify the interfaces that belong to a point to point network by configuring the network command. So this is the command network. You can also configure OSPF directly on the interface with the IP OSPF command, so the IP OSPF command. Basic syntax for the network command is shown here. So we have the router, then in the configuration we can enter network and you can enter the network address. You can enter the wildcard mask, the area, and then the area is a key term, and then you can enter the area ID. The network address wildcard mask syntax is used to enable OSPF on interfaces. Any interfaces on a router that match this part of the command are enabled to send and receive OSPF packets. 
the area uh, with the area ID syntax refers to the OSPF area. When configuring single area OSPF version 2, the network command, the network, this net key term network command must be configured with the same area ID value on all routers. So that's a very key important information. When configuring single area OSPF version 2, the network command must be configured with the same area ID value on all routers. Although any area ID can be used, it is a good practice to use an area ID of 0 with single area OSPF version 2. This convention makes it easier if the network is later altered to support multi-area OSPF2. So you had to think about the future, you had to think about troubleshooting, you had to think about all the problems that might come up. When Even when you, you are setting up a single area OSPF version 2, because you might be scaling it up to multi-area OSPF version 2 in the future, so it is recommended that you use the area ID 0 with single area OSPF version 2. And next, we're going to talk about the wildcard mask a little bit because right now we quickly went over uh, what this command uh, uh, and what are the options in this command. You probably uh, either heard about the wildcard mask, but have no idea, or never heard about it. So I will uh, look. Uh, I will show you what you know. What is wildcard mask, right? So the wildcard mask. The wildcard mask is typically the inverse of the subnet mask configured on that interface. So it is basically inverse of the subnet mask. The easiest method for calculating a wildcard mask is to subtract the network subnet mask from 255.255.255.255 as shown for slash 24 and slash 26 subnet mask in the figure below right here. So if somebody asks you, what is the wildcard mask for slash 24 networks? Only thing you need to do is take the 255, 255, 255, 255 or code 255 um, number. So one, two, three, four, that's why it's called, sometimes I call it code 255, it's like code zeros. And you're gonna minus the subnet mask, whatever the subnet mask you have. So in this case, 255, 255, 255, 255, yeah. So uh, that maybe, well, Oh, there may be something wrong here. So let's see, 255, 255, 255. Yeah, this is, yeah, this is supposed to be a subnet mask. So that would give you the wildcard. This should be zero up here. So that would give you two, zero, 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 because they're gonna get minus, and this is, should be actually zero. So they're gonna end up with 255. So that, you know, the, the wildcard mass calculation, all you need to remember is that you take the, the subnet mask, and you're gonna minus that. Oh, never mind. Sorry, this is correct. <laughs> because sorry about that. Oops, I had a brain fart. So in this, yeah. So the wildcard mask is a difference uh, uh, between the subnet mask two five five two five five two five five two five five, and the you know the subnet ma ma the mask of the, the network that you're looking at. So that's how you're calculating. And what is wildcard mask? Well. <coughs> What the wildcard uh, wildcard mask is doing is that it's gonna like you know match the you know the the networks associated with that right so that's the whole point of having a wildcard mask. So I will go through a separate uh, quick um, demonstration and a lecture on wildcard mask, and you should remember you know how to do this for your exams and quizzes. Uh, some universities and colleges may allow you to have a cheat sheet. In that case, I will also give you an, an option, like an example, some website that has some wildcard masks listed on there. So you can use that to write your exams and quizzes. So the school that I went to, they allow us to have a, a open lab book. So I can enter, like I can have open book lab. So I can enter information in the lab book. And I actually wrote down my lab, wildcard mask because it is allowed. And my, it's part of the, you know, I write down how to calculate wildcard mask because the reason for that is that way I don't have to remember during an exam, right? So if your school allow open book uh, lab exams, where you, you can bring your own lab notes to your exam, I would write down at least how to calculate it so during the exam you can quickly calculate the wildcard mask because it is needed for your OSPF configurations 
uh, and also maybe show and uh, actually it will show up on your lecture exams as well for the Cisco they could ask you a question about wildcard mask on lecture exams configure OSPF using the network command within routing configuration mode there are two ways to identify the interfaces that will participate in the OSPF version 2 routing process. In the first example, the wildcard mask identifies the interface based on the network address. Any active interface that is configured with an IPv4 address belong to that network will now participate in the OSPF version 2 process. So note, some iOS versions of Cisco devices allow the subnet mask to be entered instead of the wildcard mask. The iOS then converts the subnet mask to a wildcard mask. So when you are entering <coughs> the wildcard mask in here, for example, so the IP address 10.10.1.0, .10 so that is the network IP address. So that's a network IP. And then the wildcard mask of 0.0.0.255 in the area zero. In some, the, oh, I believe the newer uh, iOS Cisco versions, you can actually enter the just the subnet mask and it will automatically convert to wildcard mask uh, by the Cisco iOS. However, as students, as someone who is learning network uh, technical systems and network engineering, you should not assume these things done by the uh, operating system and firmware, in this case, iOS firmware. So... It is recommended as students, if you are, if I'm your instructor, to make sure that you enter the correct wildcard mask, because there may be situations, um, um, non-Cisco devices and other devices that make, it doesn't do that. It will end up with an error message or something. So get used to using wildcard mask instead of uh, entering the you know subnet mask. So again. Some Cisco iOS versions, most newer switches and routers and etc. Especially routers, I mean in this case, it will convert the subnet mask into wildcard mask because it knows, it's intelligent enough to know that. But please, 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 please use the wildcard mask every single time you enter uh, uh, the, this, uh, this type of command for SPF so that you will get used to uh, using wildcard mask, calculating wildcard mask, so you are getting better at what you are doing. So again, that is a key thing that you should remember, right? So that uh, that's it. So as an alternate, uh, I OSPF version 2 can be entered by specifying the exact interface IPv4 address using a COD0 wildcard mask. So instead of doing the specific the, the wildcard mask associated with this you can also use the cod zero wildcard mask but uh, in this case it's a, it's a different alternate method and entering network uh, in this example 10.1.1.5 with C, uh, cod zero with area zero on r1 tells the router to enable the interface gigabit ethernet 000 for the routing process so it's basically telling the system to basically enable the gigabit ethernet uh, 000 for the routing process. The advantage of specifying the interface is that the wildcard mask calculation is not necessary. Notice that all cases, in all cases, the area arguments still specify the area zero. So if you, even if you look at here, you have area zero here, and right here, area zero here. Again, I will show all of this on a lab demonstration on a separate video, but for now, just understand the concepts behind this. Configure OSPF using the IP OSPF command. To configure OSPF directly on the interface, use the IP OSPF. So this is a command, IP OSPF command, and the interface configuration mode. So for syntax for that is the inside the IP interface configuration mode, that's why config-f is the IP OSPF, so that's the command, and you can enter the process ID, so that's a variable, that value that you're gonna enter, and then the area, so that's a key term, and the variable is the, you know, key area, sorry, area ID. Remember, we are using area zero, because we are doing the single area, and that's a recommender, right? So, remove the network commands using no form of the command, then go to the each interface and configure IP OSPF command. So in here, 
if you already have set up the commands from our previous slides on your lab we can do uh, router ospf 10 because that's what we are working on the area of 10 and we're gonna go no and then enter the information no enter the same command no enter the same command so that will get rid of all of those then to configure ospf using the ip ospf command we're gonna go into the interface in this case interface gigabit 000 and we're gonna enter ip ospf 10 area 0 and the interface gigabit ethernet 001 and then ip config 10 area 0 interface loopback 0 ip uh, uh, ospf 10 area 0 so on and so forth so that's how the ip ospf command is used passive interface by default ospf messages are forwarded out all ospf enable interfaces however these messages only need to be sent out interfaces that are connecting to other ospf enable routers so by default the ospf messages are forwarded out all ospf enable interfaces however that, that's going to create overburden to send some networks so it's going to cre make create congestion so remember that these messages only need to be sent out the interfaces that are connecting to ospf enable routers right so sending out unneeded messages on a LAN affect the network three ways. Uh, so inefficient use of bandwidth, as I mentioned, overburden. Uh, so available bandwidth is consumed, transporting unnecessary messages that doesn't need to be there. Inefficient use of resources. So all devices on the LAN must process and eventually discuss those messages that doesn't need. Increased security risk too. So without additional OSPF security configurations, OSPF messages can be intercepted with packet sniffing software and the routing updates can be modified and sent back to the router corrupting the routing table with false metrics and misdirect traffic so these are the three issues associated with OSPF uh, default uh, you know configuration which forwards all OSPF uh, packets ac across all and OSPF enable uh, interfaces so the passive uh, interfaces we can use the passive interface so passive dash interface command on the router configuration mode to prevent the transmission of routing messages through a router interface but still allow that network to be advertised to other routers so all the routing interfaces that are connected to devices other than the the interfaces that are connected to the other routers you know, uh, you know, we can prevent those interfaces uh, from transmitting routing messages because the the router that is connected to the other router that is trying to build this OSPF network is the one or has been built uh, with the OSPF network is the one that need to have those messages sent, right? So the passive dash interface command will do exactly that. So the show IP protocols command is then can be used to verify the interface is listed as passive so on the right hand side there is a screenshot of the lab which i'm going to do on a separate video and it shows the router ospf 10 and we're gonna after we enter into the that ospf 10 configuration mode we're going to enter the command passive dash interface and we're going to give loop back zero and we're going to exit out of it now if you run show ip protocols you see that the passive interface is set up in here as the loop back zero so that now we have a passive interfaces configured in this uh, ospf configuration ospf point-to-point -point networks by default cisco routers elect dr and bdr on ethernet interfaces even if there is only one other device on the link you can verify this with the show ip ospf command so if you run the show ip ospf command with the interface um, associated with that you, whatever the one that you're looking at it will show you uh, that information so the designator router and the backup designator router on ethernet interfaces in cisco routers by default the cisco will elect the dr and bdr automatically so uh, the DR uh, slash BDR election process is unnecessary as there can only be two routers um, 
on the point to point network between r1 and r2 because the point to point network doesn't have any backup right because it just have one router and another router just connected either one one link right or like it's just a router to router connection right so it is unnecessary to have dr and bdr notice in the output that the router has designated the network type as broadcast so in here you can see the designated router and interface and all the information and the network type up here is showing as broadcast this is because the cisco routers automatically elects the dr and bdr on ethernet interfaces even if there is only one other device on the link so this is why this is happening to change this to point to point network use the interface configuration command ip ospf network point to point so you're going to enter the command ip ospf network point dash two dash point command and that need to be entered on all interfaces where you want to disable the dr bdr election process so you have to enter on all the interfaces that you need to disable that the B dr bdr election process so in here in the router one that we see that they have entered the ip ospf network point to point command point dash two dash point command and that command um, as soon as you enter it you see some um, cisco log messages right here and then if you go back and enter show ip ospf interface and then you enter the interface you can see now the network type change to point to point so if you go back here network type remember is in broadcast but with this command ip ospf network point dash point two uh, in the interface within the interface now that the interface can be changed back to point to point so if you have multiple interfaces you can do it in one go as well right you don't need to go one at a time remember how to select multiple interfaces if you interface range for example uh, can be used if it is a range of interfaces that you need to do this and i will go through that in a separate uh you know uh, lab video but remember uh this command the ospf network point to point uh for you know disabling the dr bdr election process for certain interfaces loopbacks and point to point networks use loopbacks to provide additional interfaces for a variety of purposes so by default loopback interfaces are advertised as slash 32 host routes to simulate a real lan the loopback interface can be configured as a point to point network to advertise the full network what r2 sees when r1 advertises the loopback interface is this so if you run if you go to the r2 of the topology that i showed you at initially on this lecture if you run the uh, show ip route and if you pipe or filter out the include 10.10.1 this is what you will see in the, our topology the configuration change at r1 the interface loopback zero with the ip ospf network point to point the r2 now have changed that uh, value so we have the sh the sh show ip route now we have 10 10 1 0 slash 24 so this the slash 32 has changed to slash 24 so that's what uh, you know the key point that you should get out of this again i will go through these labs and it will you know a different video that will give you a better idea about what i'm covering here so for now just understand the concepts behind it there's a packet tracer file called point to point single area ospf version 2 configuration if you have access to this file please go ahead and do it if you do not i will try to find a copy of it and post it to my uh, website sanuja.com uh, and i'll post a link in the description when i do that for now just remember you know the concept that we have covered if you don't have access to this file multi-access ospf networks ospf network types another type of network that uses ospf is the multi-access ospf network the multi-access ospf networks are unique in that the router controls the distribution of las 
The router that is elected for this role should be determined by the network administrator through proper configuration. So the configuration is needed for this type of systems to work. So this diagram is showing an example of a network. Uh, so remember that the multi-access OSPF networks are unique in that the router controls the distribution of LAS, but however, it needed to be configured by you, the system administrator or network administrator. OSPF designated router. In multi-access network, OSPF elects DR, which is the designated router, and BDR, backup designated router. The DR is responsible for collecting and distributing LAS sent and received. DR uses the multicast IPv4 address 24, uh, 24, sorry, 224.0.05, which is meant for all OSPF routers. I have mentioned that in my previous lectures and slides as well. Remember, the DR uses the multicast IPv4 address 224.0.05, and that is meant for all OSPF routers. A DBR is also elected in case the DR fails. The BDR listens passively and maintains a relationship with all the routers. If the DR stops producing hello packets, the BDR promotes itself and assumes the role of DR. So that's the whole point of having a backup designated router. All other routes become um, DR other, which are, again, I actually went uh, over in my previous lecture a little bit. A router that is neither the DR nor BDR would be then considered as DR other. DR others use the multi-access address, which is 224.0.06 uh, to send OSPF packets to DR and BDR. So all designated routers would be using that 224.0.06. Only the DR and BDR listens for the 224.0.06. So remember that only the DR and BDR listen to the 224.0.06. OSPF multi-access reference topology. So on the right hand side of your screen, this is the reference topology. This is an example topology that we will be using for our next few slides and configuration examples. So I, if, if you like, you can take a screenshot of this and have it on the side as you go through this video or remember how this topology is set up. So in the multi-access topology shown on the figure, there are three routers interconnected over a common Ethernet multi-access network, which is the 192.168.1.0/24. That's represented right here. Because the routers are connected over a common multi-access network, the OSPF has automatically elected the DR and BDR. The router 3, R3, has been elected as the DR because its route ID is 3.3.3.3, which is the highest in this network. So if you look at the R3, you can see the router ID is higher, so 3.3.3.3, therefore that's going to get elected as the DR. The R2 is the BDR because it has a second highest route ID in the network. So the R2, if you look at it, that has the second highest route ID out of all those three. So that become the BDR. Verify OSPF router roles. So to verify the router roles in OSPF version two routers, you can use the show IP OSPF interface command. So that's the command, show IP OSPF interface command. The output generated by R1 confirms the following. Remember from the previous topology on the previous page we look at? So on the R1 of that topology, you can, you can run the show IP OSPF interface command. So that's what they have done right here on the bottom of the screen. The R1 is not the DR or BDR, but is a DR other with the default priority of one. We know that because right here it says the state DR other and the default priority set to one. The DR is the R3 with the route ID 3.3.3.3 at IPv4 address of 192.168.1.3 while the BDR is the R2 with the route ID 2.2.2 uh, with the IP address of 192.168.1.2 and you can see that 
in here with the show IP OSPF interface command because it's showing up right here. Right here, it says backup designated router and the designated router. 2.2.2.2 .2 is the backup and the 3.3.3.3 is the DR, right? The designated router. R1 has two adjacencies, one with the BDR and the other one with the DR. So you can clearly see the adjacencies build uh, here as well. So the designated backup router shown up here as well, it's right here. And the designated router. So designated router, designated backup router, and these are just adjac adjacencies. So typically they both shows up when it's properly working OSPF. So that is for the R1. And on the R2, if you run the same command, the show IP OSPF interface command, now you see that in the R2, the BDR with the default priority of one, and uh, uh, we know it is the BDR because it says the state is BDR with the default priority one, and the DR is the R3 with the route ID 3.3.3 .3 with IP address 192.168.1.3, and uh, while the B BDR is the R2 with the route ID 2.2.2 .2 with IP address 192.168.1.2, and you can see that information right here. And in this situation, unlike the R2, sorry, R1, the R2 is now the BDR with the priority one. So you can see that in here. And with the R3, what you're gonna see is the R3 is the DR with the default priority of one, because you see the, here is the state as the DR with the default priority of one. And then the uh, R3 has a router ID uh, uh, information associated with 3.3.3 .3 with IP address 192.168.1.3 while the BDR is the R2 uh, with the IP address uh, of uh, 192.168.1.2. So R3 has two adjacencies and one neighboring the uh, route ID 1.1.1 and the other uh, is the BDR and it is shown right here. Verify DR and BDR adjacencies. To verify the OSPF version 2 adjacencies, we can use the command show IP uh, OSPF neighbor. So that's the command, show IP OSPF neighbor. The state of neighbors in multi-access networks can be described as this. So we have the full slash uh, DR other, full slash GR, full slash BDR, and two-way slash BD, sorry, uh, full uh, two-way slash DR other. So the full slash DR other, uh, this is a DR or BDR router that is fully adjacent as, sorry, fully adjacent with the non-DR uh, non or BDR router. So these two neighbors can exchange hello packets, update query, uh, queries and you know, replies and acknowledgements when it is full slash uh, DR other. Full slash DR, uh, the router is fully adjacent with the indicated DR neighbor. These two neighbors can exchange hello packets, updates, queries, replies, and acknowledgements. So it's the same thing as the previous one. So it can do all of those functions. Full slash BDR, the router is fully adjacent with the indicated BDR neighbor. And again, these two neighbors can exchange hello packets, updates, queries, replies, and acknowledgements. Two-way slash uh, D, uh, DR other. The, the, in this situation, the non-DR and BDR routers has the neighbor relationship with the, uh, another uh, non-DR or BDR router, and these two neighbors can exchange just the hello packets. So you should know what these means and what they stand for and what are the differences between those. The normal state of for an OSPF router is usually full if a router is stuck in another state, it is an indication that there are problems in forming adjacencies. The only exception to this is the two-way state, which is normal in a multi-access broadcast network. So you should know that. So the normal state for an OSPF router is the full state, right? One of those full states. Uh, so uh, if the router is uh, stuck in a, another state, that means it may be that you may have some problems with your network, right? So the exception is just the two-way states. So remember that. Verify DR and BDR adjacencies. The 
output generated by R2 confirms that the R2 has adjacencies with the following routers. The R1 router with the ID 1.1.1 is full state. Uh, R1 is neither the DR nor BDR. Then the R3 router with the ID 3.3.3.3 is in a full state and the role of R3 is the DR. So if you run that uh, command on R2, the show IP OSPF neighbor, because that's how you're gonna figure out what neighbors are associated with your OSPF configuration with respect to the router that you are working on. And um, it will display a table. The table will have the router ID, sorry, neighbor ID, uh, the state and uh, the date timer and the uh, address and the interface information. So in here we have two entries, which is the 1.1.1 uh, neighbor ID and the 3.3.3, 3.3.3.3 uh, route ID. And we know one of them is full uh, DR other, the other one is full DR, the designated router. Why? Because the state that will indicate what uh, each of these neighbor IDs, uh, the neighbors are doing, the neighbor routers associated with these IDs are doing. Default DR BDR election process. The OSPF DR and BDR election is based on the following criteria in sequential order. So it goes through the specific order in terms of how the OSPF DR and BDR election process is, uh, you know, is done. So the the very first the first thing going to happen is the routers in the network elect the router with the highest interface priority as the DR the designated router the router with the second highest interface priority is become the BDR or the backup designated router the priority can be configured to be any number between 0 to 255 you should know that for your exams and quizzes if the interface priority value is set to zero, that interface cannot be elected as DR or BDR. So you should remember that as well. So if the interface priority is set to zero, it cannot be elected as DR or BDR, but the interface in the priority can be between any number between zero and 255. The default priority of multi-access broadcast interface is one. So the default for the multi-access broadcast interface is one. So the next step is if the interface priorities are equal, then the router with the highest router ID is elected as the DR. The router with the second highest router ID then would be selected as the BDR, or so the backup um, designated router. The election process takes place when the first router with the OSPF enable interface is active on the network. If all of the routers on the network have not finished booting, it is possible that a router with a lower router ID becomes the DR. So remember that. The addition of a new router does not initiate a new election process. This is a key thing that some people forget. Just because of you add a new router to a already configured OSPF network, it does not automatically initiate a new election process. So that's a very important concept that you should remember because that did come up on a, a Cisco lab exam, at least the one that I took. DR or designated router failure and recovery. After the DR is elected, it remains the DR until one of the following events occurred. The DR fails, the OSPF process on the DR fails or is stopped, the multi-access interface on the DR fails or is shut down. So if the DR fails, the BDR, which is the backup designated router, is automatically promoted to the DR. This is the case even if another uh, DR other with a higher priority or router ID is added to the network after the initial DR BDR election. Remember, if you add a, another router to already configured OSPF, it's not gonna go through election process automatically. So if the DR fails in that situation, the BDR, whatever the initially configured, initially selected BDR, gonna take over the role of DR. 
However, after a BDR is promoted to DR, a new BDR election occurs and the DR other with the highest priority or route ID is elected as the new BDR. So if you have an OSPF configuration already running and it, there is already DR and BDR already a designated router uh, as well as the, you know, and the uh, backup, backup designated router is already selected, already, you know, configured. When the, de the designated router fails, that BDR, the backup designated router going to take over the role of DR, even if there is another DR with a higher priority ID, uh, route ID is added to the network after the OSPF configuration election help process has been done. So already we have the DR and BDR election process done even with a new router added to that OSPF network with the higher router ID, is still gonna go through the same uh, BDR and gonna get elected as DR. However, however, at that point, after that BDR has been promoted to the DR, at that point, a new BDR election process gonna occur and the DR with the highest priority or the router ID now gonna get elected as the next BDR, the ba backup designated router even if it is a new router that has been added to the OSPF network. So remember that. The IP OSPF priority command. If the interface priorities are equal on all routers, the router with the highest router ID is elected the DR, the designated router. Instead of relying on the router ID, it is better to control the election by setting interface priorities. This also allows a router to be the DR in one uh, network and a DR other in another. So this also allow us to do that. So the same router can be the DR in one network and a DR other in another uh, network as a you know result of you know setting up those interface priorities. So uh, to set the priority of an interface we can use the command IP OSPF priority. So the command is IP OSPF priority with the value associated with that, where the value could be anywhere between zero to 255, as I mentioned. Again, a value of zero does not become a DR or a BDR, which I mentioned in previous slides. And the value of one to 255 on the interface makes it more likely that the router becomes a DR or the BDR. So remember that. Configure OSPF priority. The example shows the commands being used to change the R1 interface G000 priority from one to 255 and then resetting the OSPF process. So if you look at here, in this example, we have the interface gigabit ethernet 000. So now we are in the interface configuration mode. And in there, we enter, we have entered IP OSPF priority 255. And then we run that clear IP OSPF process, which is going to clear all IP uh, uh, OSPF processes and you're going to reset that. And when you press Y here, and then it's going to, you know, reset uh, the values. Uh, now it will have the OSPF uh, priority of 255. So that's how, you know, you can configure the priority settings that already have been, you know, already running OSPF uh, configured network. So if you have access to the packet tracer file called determine the DR and BDR, the designated router and uh, backup designated router, please, please go ahead and do it. If you do not have access to that file, I will try to find a copy and post to my uh, sanity.com website so you can go ahead and do it because that will enhance your understanding about uh, how uh, the concepts uh, that we covered works in a lab environment. Modify single area OSPF version two. Cisco OSPF cost metric. Routing protocols use a metric to determine the best path of a packet across a network. OSPF uses costs as a metric a lower cost indicates a better path. The Cisco cost 
of an interface is inversely proportional to the bandwidth of the interface. Therefore, a higher bandwidth indicates a lower cost. The formula used to calculate the OSPF cost is the cost equal to reference bandwidth divided by the interface bandwidth. The default reference bandwidth is 10 to the 8, which is like 100,000 right here. Uh, 1 million, right? Yeah, right here. And therefore, the formula is the cost equal to uh, 10 to the 8 BPS divided by the interface bandwidth in BPS. Because the OSPF cost value must be an integer, the fast Ethernet, gigabit Ethernet, and 10 uh, uh, gig Ethernet interfaces share the same cost. The co to correct this situation, you can adjust the interface bandwidth with the auto dash cost reference dash bandwidth command on each of the OSPF router. So that's the, the command that you need to use auto dash cost reference dash bandwidth. Or you can also manually set the OSPF cost value with the IP OSPF cost command, IP OSPF cost command uh, on necessary interfaces. So that's, that's how you can correct this situation. Uh, one of the key things you should remember as a student, especially this is if this is your first time learning about OSPF, the higher bandwidth indicates a lower cost. Remember that. Because lowest cost is the best path, right? So OSPF US uses the cost metric uh, to calculate the best path and the lower cost indicates the best path. So that means the higher the bandwidth, the lower the cost going to be and that is the path the OSPF gonna select. So it's like inversely proportional. So remember that on your exams because sometimes that can trip you over, right? So remember that. So Cisco OSPF um, cost matrix uh, table is shown here. This is a, just a reference table uh, breakdown of the cost calculations the Cisco uh, matrix use. So you can see this, um, you know, we have the interface type on the left hand side and you have the reference bandwidth in, um, in this middle with the default bandwidth being divided from that. And then you can see the cost matrix calculation and on the gigabit Ethernet, fast uh, Ethernet uh, 100 megabyte per second and Ethernet uh, 10 megabyte per second, the cost uh, break down into oh, the same value because we are looking at integers and even gigabit 10 is actually have the one. So this is the problem that we were talking about on the previous slide because when the, these calculations are done, they all, the, the integer or value end up becoming the same. Adjust the reference bandwidth. So now we're gonna look at how we can mitigate that, right? So the cost value must be an integer. So if something less than an integer is calculated, the OSPF rounds up the to that to the nearest integer. Therefore, the OSPF cost assigned to a gigabit ethernet interface with the default reference bandwidth of uh, the, this value, BPS would be equal to one because the nearest uh, integer uh, for that, uh, the point one is basically one instead of, you know, zero instead of one, right? So the cost gonna get calculated to one. For this reason, all interfaces faster than fast ethernet will have the same cost value of one as the fast ethernet interface. To assist OSPF in making the correct path determination, the interface bandwidth must be changed to a higher value to accommodate network with links faster than 100 megabyte per second. So that's how you can fix that issue. Changing the reference bandwidth does not actually affect the bandwidth capacity on the link. Rather, it simply affects the calculation used to determine the metric. So just because of your changing the bandwidth value, Obviously, this is not gonna change the bandwidth its capacity itself. It just affects the calculation process. The uh, to, to adjust the reference bandwidth, uh, use the auto dash cost reference dash bandwidth, and you can enter the bandwidth value uh, right after that in the router configuration command. This command must be configured on every router in the OSPF domain. And notice in the command that the value is expressed in megabyte per second and therefore to adjust the cost for the gigabyte ethernet, use the command auto-cost-reference-bandwidth-1000. 
For 10 gigabit Ethernet, use the command auto dash cost reference dash bandwidth 10,000. To return to the default reference bandwidth, we can use the command auto dash cost reference bandwidth 100 command. So these need to be done on every single router on your OSPF area so that the cost calculation is correctly done. And another option is to change the cost on one specific interface using the IP OSPF cost and then the cost associated command. So you're just gonna change the cost of a one inter specific interface. That could be an option that you can use as well. Whichever method is used, it is important to apply the configuration to all routers in the OSPF routing domain. The table shows the OSPF cost if the reference bandwidth is adjusted to accommodate the 10 gigabit Ethernet links. The reference bandwidth should be adjusted any time there are links faster than fast Ethernet um, connection, which is the 100 megabyte per second. You can use the show IP OSPF interface command to verify the current OSPF version 2 cost assigned to the interfaces. So you can use the show IP OSPF interface. That's the command you can use to verify those information. And here's a table again showing after the change has been made. Now it has the cost of 10 for the, uh, sorry, cost of one for the 10 gigabyte Ethernet, cost of 10 for the uh, the, for the Ethernet with the one gigabyte and cost of 100 for the 100 megabyte and the cost of 1000 for the 10 gigabyte. So the gear 10 gigabit uh, Ethernet connection compared to 10 megabytes in Ethernet connection has the uh, the lower cost, but therefore the priority here, right? So that's what we have done. Again, when I go through the live lab demonstrations, those videos, that would explain all of this in much more details in a more comprehensive way for, for now, just remember this. OSPF accumulates cost. The cost of an OSPF route is the accumulated value from one router to the destination network. Assuming the auto cost reference dash bandwidth 10,000 command has been configured on all three routers, the cost of the links between each router is now will be 10. The loopback interfaces will have a default cost of one. So remember the uh, network example, uh, we had the network diagram at the very beginning of this lecture. So this is the same network. Now we assume that the auto dash cost reference dash bandwidth 10,000 has been entered on all of those routers. And as a result, the cost of all of these gonna end up becoming 10. You can calculate the cost for each router to each network. For example, the total cost for R1 to reach the 10.10.2.0 slash 24 network is 11 because you can actually calculate that using this. This is because the link to the R2 cost equal to 10. So in here, you can see that the R2, uh, where's R2, right here, the link between these two is the cost of 10. And the loopback default cost was, uh, cost is equal to one. So the loopback is still sitting at one. So that means 10 plus one is equal to 11. The loopback is one, the, this cost is 10. So the 10 plus one is equal to 11. Therefore the cost for the R1 to reach the 10.10.2.0 would be the 10 plus one equal to 11. You can verify this with the show IP route command on your Cisco routers, show IP route command. So know how to calculate this because this does show up on your exams. Verifying the accumulated cost for path to the 10.10.2.0 slash 24 network in the R1, you can enter the show IP route and then you can pipe it or filter it out the 10.10.2.0 and you can see uh, the metric information and the route metric is 11. You can see that right here. And also in here, uh, in, in this command actually shows right here, the cost right here, that shows 11. And show IP route with the 10.10.2, uh, you can see the matrix clearly explicitly defined right here. 
So this is actually the matrix, the same matrix shown here in a different way. So if you run show IP route with um, piping or filtering this, it'll show like this. But if you run show IP route with the, that network, 10.10.2.0 network, it'll actually explicitly define that matrix is 11 right here. Again, when we go through the lab videos, you'll get a better idea about you know how this actually works. Manually set OSPF cost value. Reasons to manually set the uh, cost value includes the administrator may want to influence path selection within OSPF, causing different paths to be selected than what normally would given the default cost and cost uh, accumulation. And another reason would be the connections to equipment from other vendors who use a different formula to calculate OSPF cost. So basically if you have multi-vendor um, situation where you have Cisco routers and some other routers, some HP for IBM routers, for example, set up in the same OSPF uh, environment, you may need to manually uh, cre uh, create those cost values so that uh, there won't be any conflict if they are using different methods to uh, calculate those cost values. So those are reasons why an administrator may want to manually uh, set the cost values on an OSPF router. So how do you change uh, those uh, OSPF uh, cost values? Uh, you can use the IP OSPF cost command in Cisco devices. So Cisco routers, you can run the IP OSPF cost and then you can enter the value uh, you're gonna set. So in this example on the bottom of your screen, you have the interface G001 and we are setting up the IP OSPF cost value of 30 here. And for the loopback, we're gonna set the uh, IP, uh, um, the, the cost value for OSPF of 10 using the IP OSPF cost command. So that's how you can manually set the cost value. Uh, what really important here is, yes, for your Cisco lab exams, you should know this command, but you should know for everything else, like for your you know day day to day uh, work, why we actually said um, you know may have to do the, this uh, manually manual configuration. So there are situations where you need to influence the path selection within OSPF uh, because of a network uh, engineering requirements or because you have a multi-vendor situation where different formulas are used to calculate the OSPF cost and that is causing some problems in your OSPF network because of the multi-vendor environment. So now you can uh, go and manually set those cost values to fix that issue. Test failover backup route. So what happens if the link between R1 and R2 goes down? Remember our network diagram example uh, from a couple of slides ago? So that's what they are referring to as R1 and R2. So what happens if the link between R1 and R2 goes down? You can simulate that by shutting down the gigabit ethernet 000 interface and verifying the routing table is updated to use R3 as the next hop router. So that's how that's how you can verify that the, the failover actually works. You can simply shut down one of the interfaces and see what happened. So notice that the R1 can now reach the 10114 slash 30 network through R3 with the cost value of 50. So after you shut down and you can run the show IP route OSPF and we're gonna pipe it or filter out the begin with 10. And you can see now the 10.1.1.4 slash 30 still can be reached um, through the R3 with the cost value of 50 because it's showing right here. So that's how you actually test the failover backup route. Hello packet intervals. OSPF version two, hello packets are transmitted to multicast address of two 24.0.05. So all OSPF routers are gonna receive those hello packets every 10 seconds. This is the default timer value on multi-access and point-to-point -point networks. So note hello packets are not sent on interfaces set to passive by the passive-interface command. So if you have entered the passive-interface command on any of the interfaces, the hello packets will not be sent. The dead interval is the period that the router waits to receive a hello packet before declaring the neighbor is down. So that's the 
the purpose of the dead interval. So dead interval is the period exactly what is described that he waits to receive a hello packet before declaring the neighbor is down. If the dead interval expires before the routers receive a hello packet, the OSPF removes that neighbor from its link state database, also known as LSDB. The router floods the LSDB with information about the down neighbor out all OSPF enabled interfaces. Cisco uses a default of four times the hello interval. This is 40 seconds on multi-access and point-to-point -point network. So the default is actually 10 seconds, but the Cisco uses uh, a four times the hello interval. So that this is the 40 seconds on multi-access point-to-point networks. So again, the dead interval is a period of the router waits for the hello packets before declaring the neighbor is down. If the dead interval expires before the router receives a hello packet. The OSPF removes the neighbor from its link state database, also known as LSDB. The router floods the LSDB with information about the down neighbor to all OSPF enabled interfaces. This is a key piece of information you should remember. So the Cisco uses the default time of, uh, default of four times the hello interval. So it's Cisco's dead interval is the four times the hello interval. So it's going to just multiply four times the hello interval, sorry, hello, hello packets send, how often? So it's 10 seconds. So that the dead interval is on Cisco switch routers are by default set to 40 seconds on multi-access and point-to-point -point networks. So that's the Cisco's default. So Cisco by default sent 10 seconds hello packets and has a dead interval by default 40 seconds. Verify hello and dead intervals. The OSPF hello and dead intervals are configurable on per interface basis. The OSPF intervals must match or a neighbor adjacency does not occur. So if you don't have a OSPF interval that is matching, a neighbor adjacency never gonna occur. To verify the currently configured OSPF version two interface intervals, you can use the show IP OSPF interface command. The gigabit ethernet 000 hello and dead intervals are set to the default 10 seconds and the 40 seconds respectively. So the hello interval, as I mentioned before, by default on Cisco is 10 and the Cisco used the 10, uh, 40 second, uh, you know, dead interval, right? So if you go show IP OSPF interface G000 in this case, you can see the timer intervals right here on down here. And it says the hello to the 10 seconds and dead to the 10 seconds. So that's what it is right here. You can use the show IP OSPF neighbor command to see the dead timer accounting down from 40 seconds. By default, this value is refresh every 10 seconds when the R1 receive a hello from the neighbor. So if you run the show IP OSPF neighbor, remember that that's the same command we used in our previous slides, but now we are looking at this column, the dead time, and it shows here the time which has been, you know, passed since, um, you know, it's looking for that hello packet. So you can use the show IP OSPF neighbor. It's the same command that we used previously that shows the countdown. Modify OSPF version two intervals. It may be desirable to change the OSPF timers so that the routers detect the network failures in less time. Doing this increases the traffic, but sometimes the need for a quick convergence is more important than the extra traffic it creates. So that means it is a quick uh, way to mitigate issues um, by increasing the traffic, however, in the area. The default hello and dead intervals are based on the best practices and should only be altered in rare situations. So the only time you're gonna do this is if, if for your lab exams, if they ask you to do it, please do it. Uh, for other situations, only time you do it in the real world is that it is really needed to be done. So the OSPF version two hello and dead intervals can be modified manually using the following interface configuration mode command. So you go into the interface configuration, so you're gonna select the interface, and then you're gonna issue the command IP OSPF hello dash interval, and you're gonna enter the seconds that you need to configure. 
IP OSPF dead dash interval and you're gonna enter the seconds that you need to configure whatever the one you choose arbitrarily. You can use the no IP OSPF hello interval and no IP OSPF dead interval commands to reset the intervals back to their default states. So you can just enter no at the front of this and that will reset those intervals back to the default states. In the example, the hello interval or the link between the, sorry, hello interval for the link between the R1 and R2 is changed to five in seconds. The Cisco iOS automatically modifies the dead interval to four times the hello interval. However, you can document the new dead interval in the configuration by manually setting it to 20 seconds as shown as well. So when the dead timer on R1 expires, the R1 and R2 loses adjacency. The R1 and R2 must be configured with the same hello interval. Otherwise it will not create adjacency. Remember that those routers within that OSPF area has to have the same configurations for these settings. Otherwise it won't work. So use the show IP OSPF neighbor command on R1 to verify the neighbor adjacencies have been, uh, you know, rebuilt. So in this case, remember on Cisco iOS, it will automatically modify this, the dead interval to four times of that, but you can also manually set it out as well. So IP OSPF hello interval, we are setting at five and the IO, uh, IP OSPF dead interval, we are setting it to 20 and it's gonna, uh, you know, uh, rebuild that the neighbor adjacencies uh, based on this, assuming that the R1 and R2 have the same hello intervals, because if you change hello intervals on a one router, you need to make sure that the other connected routers are also having the same, otherwise the OSPF uh, adjacency building gonna fail. There's a packet tracer file called modify single area OSPF version two. If you have access to that, please go ahead and do it. If you do not, I will try to find a copy and post to my sanuj.com website so you can download and go ahead and do them. Default route propagation. Propagate a default static route in OSPF version two. To propagate a default route, the edge router must be configured with the following items. So a default static route using the IP route and then zero, 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 zero. We also call this cot zero, cot zero. And then you can give the next top uh, address or the exit interface. So that's the command. IP route, cot zero, cot zero, and then next top IP address or the exit interface, that's gonna be the command. The default information originate, this is another command, default dash or information originate in the router configuration, command settings, uh, that would instruct the R2 to be the source of the default route information and propagate the default statics route in OSPF updates. So the default dash information originate would instruct the R2, in this case we are entering that in the R2 router, to become the source of the default route information and propagate the default static route in OSPF updates. In the example here, the R2 is configured with a loop back to simulate a connection to the internet. The default route is configured and propagated to all other OSPF routers in the routing domain because we are using the command default dash uh, information originate. Please note, when configuring static route, best practice is to use the next hop IP address. However, when simulating a connection to the internet, there is no next hop IP address and therefore we use the uh, exit uh, interface uh, argument. So that's how, that's why we do that way, right? So we have the interface uh, loopback one and we have the IP address associated with that and the subnet mask with it. And we're, we're gonna go to IP route. This is the default route static route that we're going to configure. So IP route cot zero, cot zero, and loop back one. So that's going to be the default static route. And in OSPF um, 10, route OSPF 10, the default dash information originate command is used to make sure uh, that the R2 will become the source of the default route information and propagate the default static route in the OSPF updates. 
Verify the propagated default route. You can verify the default route settings on R2 using show IP route command. So that's the command, show IP route command. You can also verify the R1 and R3 receive a default route. Notice that the route source on R1 is E, sorry, zero, sorry, O star E2. So the R1 is O star E2. That signify that the, it was learned using the OSPF version 2. So right here, O star E2. That means it is using the OSPF version 2 to learn that route right here. The asterisk identifies this as a good candidate for default route. The E2 designation identifies that it is an external route. The meaning of E1 and E2 is beyond the scope of this module. So you don't need to learn what is the difference between E1 and E2 for now. Just know that the O star E2 basically signify that it was learned using OSPF version 2. So that's what you're showing here on the R1. On the R2, it also shows the gateway of last resort with the 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. And in the S star, that shows the directly connected loopback 1 because that's what the default loopback 1 that we have set, set in the previous slide I showed you. And on the R1, you see with the C O uh, star E2. Again, there is a packet tracer file called propagate a default route in OSPF version 2. If you have access to this packet tracer activity, please go ahead and do them. If you do not, I will try to find a copy and post to sanuju.com website so you can download it and do them. And this will enhance your understanding of some of the concepts that we have covered. Verify single area OSPF version 2. Verify OSPF neighbors. After configuring single area OSPF version 2, you will need to verify your configurations. The following two commands are practically useful for verifying, sorry, particularly useful for verifying routing. So those commands include the show IP interface brief and show IP route. So the show IP interface brief verifies that the desired interfaces are active with correct IP addressing and while the show IP route verifies that the routing table contains all expected routes. Additional commands for determining that the OSPF is operating as expected includes the show IP OSPF neighbor, show IP uh, protocols, show IP OSPF, and show IP OSPF interface. So the use of the show IP OSPF neighbor command uh, is shown here on here on the bottom of your pay screen right now on this slide and that verify the router has form and adjacency with its neighboring routers. If the router ID of the neighboring router is not displayed or if it does not show as being in a state of full, the two routers have not formed the OSPF version 2 adjacency. Please note a non-designated uh, router or uh, the, the uh, backup designated router that has a neighbor relationship, another non-designated router or non-backup designated router will display a two-way adjacency instead of full. So please note that. The following command output display the neighbor table for R1 in our topology that in our example here. So we have show IP um, OSPF neighbor and you see that uh, the same table that we have been looking at uh, throughout uh, the last couple of slides. Two routers may not form OSPF version 2 adjacency if the following occurs. The subnet masks do not match causing the routers to be on separate networks. The OSPF version 2 hello or dead timers do not match. The OSPF version 2 network types do not match or there is a missing or incorrect OSPF version 2 network commands. So remember, one of the key things that you need to remember for the lab exams, please, please make sure that all the OSPF area that you're working, all the routers within that OSPF area that you're working on have the same hello and dead timers. They have to be matched and the network types has to match 
And if there's a mismatch, the adjacency not gonna get created. They are not gonna work in the OSPF area. That's the most common problem that I see. And obviously missing no incorrect uh, network command can result in the same type of uh, situation with some issues within your OSPF network. Verify OSPF protocol settings. So you can use the show IP protocols command to quick uh, way to verify uh, OSPF configuration information as shown in the command output on the right hand side. So on the right hand side, you see they have used the show IP protocols to verify the OSPF protocol settings. This includes the OSPF version 2 process ID. Uh, you can see right here the process ID OSPF 10. Um, the router ID, uh, the interface explicitly uh, configured to advertise the OSPF route, the neighbor uh, the router is receiving updates from, and the default administrative distance, which is 110 uh, for OSPF. So you can see all of these things right here. See, these are the default for OSPF. Um, and then you can see the uh, the OSPF uh, area 10 here, router ID, associated router IDs, and then the uh, the interfaces that been explicitly defined and used, and they all can be displayed using show IP protocols for verification. Verify OSPF process information. Uh, the show IP OSPF command can also be used to examine the OSPF version 2 process ID and router ID as shown on the output on the right hand side. And this command displays the OSPF version 2 area information and the last time the SPF algorithm was executed. So right here we have the uh, the OSPF area 10 uh, this, uh, information will be the show IP OSPF and with the uh, ID of 1.1.1.1 and it shows the SPF algorithm executed four times right here and all of that information can be viewed using the show IP OSPF. Verify OSPF interface settings. So to do that, we can use the command show IP OSPF interface right here, show IP OSPF interface command, and that provide details list of every uh, OSPF version two enable interface. Specify an interface to display set uh, the settings of uh, um, just that interface. Uh, this command shows the process ID, uh, the local router ID, the type of the network, the OSPF cost, DR, BDR information on multi-access links, uh, which is not shown here, but in a multi-access link, that's what it would show, and the adjacent neighbors. So in my lab demonstration video, I will show you the multi-access links showing up as well. So in here, we have the router one, we show the show IP OSPF interface and we give the specific interface in here is G000 and it shows the process ID of 10 and the router ID of 1.1.1.1 and the network type is showing as point to point with the cost of 10. And it also shows the neighbor counts uh, and the adjacency uh, formation. So in here adjacency has been formed uh, with the neighbor of 2.2.2.2. So it's all shown here with that command. To get a quick summary of OSPF version 2 enable interfaces, use the show IP OSPF interface brief command. So show IP OSPF interface brief as shown in the command output right here in the down of in the bottom of this uh, slide. This command is useful for seeing important information including the interfaces are participating in OSPF, networks that are being advertised, which are IP address and the mask, the cost of each link, the network state, and the number of neighbors on each link. So this show IP OSPF interface brief can be used to uh, you know, display the network interfaces that are participating in OSPF, the network that are being advertised, the cost of each link, the network state, and the number of neighbors on the each of those links. Packet tracer file called the verify single area OSPF v2 is available to you through the Cisco NetAcad or through your academic institution. Again, if you do not have access to this file, I will try to find a copy of this file and post to my sanujit.com website so you can go ahead and do them. And again, I will try to go through this uh, lab demonstration on a live demo videos and post to my YouTube channel later sometimes. And 
I will make sure that I will go through these labs as we, uh, you know, progress through these courses. Uh, and uh, so you have a better idea about these labs as I demonstrate them on my YouTube channel. So make sure you subscribe, uh, you know, thumbs up to this video. So uh, you have, when those labs get posted, you have the opportunity uh, to view, uh, you know, those examples in live lab demonstrations. So that would bring us to the end of this lecture. So next uh, I will go through uh, the summary of what we have covered and some packet tracer files that uh, that you may have access to that you should be doing. So there is a packet tracer file called the single area OSPF version two configuration. Again, if you have access to it, please do it. If you don't, I will try to find a copy and post to my website. There's another packet tracer uh, activity called the uh, single area OSPF version two. If you don't have access to it, I will try to find a copy and post to my website so you can do them. And I will also post the videos associated with it. So here's a summary of what we have learned. So next uh, few slides, uh, I will go through them. So I have you have a complete um, picture of what uh, we went through in this uh, little bit of a longer uh, module uh, this time. So we learned the OSPF version two is enabled using the router OSPF process ID command in global configuration mode. The, I, uh, the process ID value represent the number between 1 and 65,535 and is selected by the network administrator. An OSPF router ID is a 32-bit value represented as an IPv4 address. So the router ID is used by OSPF enable router to synchronize OSPF databases and participate in the election of DR and BDR, the designated router and backup designated routers. The Cisco routers uh, derive the router ID based on one of the three criteria in this particular order. So the first thing it's going to do, the Cisco routers, uh, the router ID is explicitly configured using OSPF router ID, uh, router configuration mode command, then it's going to use that router ID. If not, the router chooses the highest IPv4 address of any of configured loopback interfaces. And if both of these are not there, what's gonna happen, the router chooses the highest active IPv4 address of any of its physical interfaces. So that's how Cisco routers derive the router IDs. The basic syntax for the network command is the network, and then you're gonna have the network address and the wildcard mask with area uh, command uh, we, along with the network command. So you have network and you're gonna enter the network address wildcard mask, then you're gonna enter area and then you're gonna enter the area ID after that. So any interfaces on a router that match the network address in the network command can send and receive OSPF packets as a result of using that wildcard associated uh, network command. When configuring a single area OSPF version two, the network command must be configured with the same area ID on all routers. So all of the routers in that, uh, you know, single area network. The wildcard mask is typically the inverse of the subnet mask configured on the uh, on that interface, but could also be a code zero with um, a code zero wildcard mask. Those code zero wildcard masks uh, would specify the uh, exact interface associated with that. Right. Uh, so, uh, think about wildcard mask. I will do a separate video on how you can calculate wildcard mask. It's going to be a quick video, and it is important that you know how to do that. Remember, two five five two five five two five five two five five. Then minus the uh, subnet mask is a one method like doing it. So, but that you know how to go about the, the process of doing that. I will cover it on a separate video. We also learned to configure OSPF directly on the interface. We use the IP OSPF interface command in the configuration mode. And the syntax is IP OSPF with the process ID and the area with the area ID. So that's the syntax we're gonna use. The use, uh, you know, we use the passive interface, passive dash interface router command um, to stop transmitting 
routing messages to a router interface but still allow that network to be advertised to other routers. We learn about the um, designated router and backup designated router election process is necessary as the uh, there, there can only be two routers on the point to point network between R1 and R2. So it is unnecessary, sorry, it is unnecessary. So if you have a point to point, point, -to -point network, there is no need for DR and BDR election process because it is unnecessary. We only have two routers. There is no backups, right? So there is no designation. That's why they use the interface configuration command IP OS PF network point dash point sorry point dash two dash point so the ip ospf network point to point command on all interfaces where you want to disable the dr bdr election process so you had to enter that in under the interface configuration by default loopback interfaces are advertised as slash 32 host routes to simulate a real lan the loopback zero interface is configured as a point to point network OSPF network types, we learn about OSPF network types. So remember those types that we learn. Uh, the DR is responsible for collecting, distributing LAS. The DR uses the multicast IPv4 address 224.0.0.5, which is meant for all OSPF routers. If the DR stop producing hello packets, their BDR promotes itself and assume the role of DR all other routers become a DR other. The DR others use the multicast address of 224.0.06 uh, to send OSPF packets to the DR and BDR and only DR and BDR listen to 224.0.06. And remember, once the BDR take over as the DR, it's gonna go through the election process of creating another um, uh, BDR because as now we need a BDR in case the new DR fails, right? So remember that as well. We also learn to verify the roles of the OSPF version two router to use the show IP OSPF uh, interface command. We also learn to verify OSPF version two adjacencies, we can use the show IP OSPF neighbor command. The state of the neighbors in multi uh, access networks can be either uh, any of these three types, uh, full slash DR other, full slash DR, full uh, uh, slash BDR or two way um, uh, B, uh, DR other. So those are the four types I mean uh, that you could have. The OSPF DR and BDR election decision is based on the router with the highest interface priority as the DR. The router with the second highest interface priority is elected as the BDR if the you know the if that is the case. If the interface priorities are equal, then the router with the highest router ID is elected as the DR. The router with the second highest router ID is the BDR because that second has become the BDR, the backup uh, designated router. The interface priority can be configured to be any number between zero and 255. However, if the interface priority value is set to zero, that interface cannot be elected as the DR or BDR. The default priority of multi-access broadcast interfaces is one. We also learn about OSPF DR and BDR elections are not preemptive. So if the DR fails, the BDR is automatically promoted to the DR. To set the priority of an interface, we can use the command IP OSPF priority with the value associated with that, where the value is again between zero and 255. And if the value is zero, the router will not become the DR or BDR. And if the value is between one and 255, then the router with the highest priority value will more likely to become the DR or BDR on the interface. We learn about the OSPF, um, uh, cost calculation matrices. So a lower cost indicates a better path than a higher cost. So that means lower cost is associated with the better bandwidth. So the formula used to calculate the OSPF cost is the cost equal to reference bandwidth divided by the interface bandwidth. 
and we learn because of the OSPF cost value must be an integer, the fast ethernet, gigabit ethernet, and 10 gig ethernet interfaces share the exact same cost because it all get rounded up to one. To correct this situation, you can adjust the interface bandwidth with the auto-cost reference-bandwidth command on each OSPF router or manually set the OSPF cost value with the IP OSPF cost command. The cost of an OSPF route is the accumulated value from one uh, router to the destination network. The OSPF cost values can be manipulated to influence the route chosen by OSPF. To change the cost value reported by, report by the local OSPF router to other OSPF routers, use the interface configuration command IP OSPF cost and then you can enter the value. IP OSPF cost and you can enter the, uh, the cost value. And know how you can calculate the OSPF cost. I quickly went over that on one of my slides. So make sure you know that because that do show up on your Cisco exams. We learn if the dead interval expires before the routers receive a hello packet, OSPF removes that neighbor from its link state database, also known as LSDB. We learn the router floods the LSDB with the information about the down neighbor out all OSPF enabled interfaces. Cisco uses a default of four times the hello interval. So the default hello interval is 10. So Cisco is the four times of that default hello interval, which is gonna be 40 seconds on multi-access and point-to-point uh, -point networks. To verify the OSPF version two interface intervals, we use the show IP uh, OSPF interface command, and we learned that the OSPF version two hello and dead intervals can be modified manually using uh, the uh, command IP OSPF hello dash interval command and IP OSPF uh, dead dash interval command. We learn in OSPF terminology, the router located between an OSPF routing domain and a non-OSPF network is called the ASBR, Area Border Router. Um, actually, in this lecture, we didn't actually uh, went depth into ASBRs, but we just slightly, you know, brush over it like a very high level. Uh, so to uh, propagate a default router, the ASBR uh, must be configured with a default static route using the command IP route cot0 cot0 with the next hop address or the exit interface. So remember that IP route, that's the default, default, you know, how you set the default route. So IP route cot0 cot0 and the next hop IP address or the default, sorry, uh, or the exit interface. And the default information dash, sorry, the default dash information originate command, uh, originate router command, uh, you know, can be set so that it will be, uh, that router will be sending out that uh, default uh, routing um, or a route to all other participants in the OSPF area. So IP route cot zero cot zero, next stop IP address or the exit interface along with the default dash information originate router command will do that. We learn how we can verify the default route settings on ASBR uh, by using the show IP route command. And we learned additional commands for de determining that the OSPF is operational. As expected, those include show IP OSPF neighbor, show IP protocols, show IP OSPF, and show IP OSPF interface. We also learn uh, the use uh, of the I, uh, show IP OSPF neighbor command to verify that the router has formed adjacency with its neighboring routers. So that would bring us to the end of this lecture. And again, I will go through the lab demonstrations and post to my YouTube channel on a separate video so that you can watch them, uh, you know, you can learn from those lab demonstration on all of these configuration options. That is the end of this module. If you like these type of lectures, please thumbs up this video and subscribe to my channel. If you have any questions or concerns regarding any of the topics that we have covered in this lecture or previous lectures, please do not hesitate to contact me and I will get back to you as soon as possible. Until next time, good luck and have a nice day.